Hello and welcome to Interabang Chats. I'm really happy today to have with us Brian Washington, whose debut novel, Memorial, um, comes out later this month. Brian, welcome to Interabang Chats. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, we're very happy to have you. Um, and we're especially thrilled because uh, you live and write from Houston, um, which in the scheme of Texas isn't that close to Dallas, but, um, but we feel a kindred with you because uh, you're a fellow Texan. So um, um, that, that's especially a good thing when we can find really great authors in Texas. Um, so you uh, wrote a short story collection uh, entitled Lot. What was that two years ago now, maybe, that that came out? It would have been actually March of 2019. So we're just over about I suppose, a year and a half or so. Yeah. Okay. Time is, I don't know, a strange thing these days. I, <laughs> I lose track. Um, Every week is a year. Yeah. And um, I, that, I would think that that story collection kind of exceeded all of your expectations. I mean, you became a superstar pretty much immediately with that. Um, but that came out in a kind of a different time, right? Um, when you were able to kind of like do some tours and has it been um, hard kind of thinking about how to get the word out about this book and this COVID environment? You know, I think that I've been really fortunate to work with the team that I do because I think that there are a number of things that like I was uncertain about as far as the memorial rollout. But one thing that was never really a question on my end was whether they'd be able to pull it off and like to what extent they'd be able to pull it off because the publicity folks that I'm working with, like uh, right now, Ashley Garland and also uh, Raven Ross and for a time, Min Jun Kim, um, are just really so proficient as far as not only like marketing the texts that they work with, but knowing how to market them and knowing which audiences might gravitate toward them naturally and which ones they perhaps need to do like more work to make it towards. So they've just done such a lovely job that I've been really fortunate, really privileged on that front. So, um, yeah, I, they do a tremendous job. I mean, the, in the book uh, store environment and with booksellers, um, we've been anticipating this book of yours, Memorial, for a long time, and it's been very, very highly acclaimed and, and with good reason. Um, so let's get into the, the novel, Memorial. It's a, um, it's a gay love story. Um, uh, two guys, Mike and Benson. And I wondered um, if you could kind of when I'm thinking about the book, it's, to me, it feels like a story about how to be happy and how to be happy um, with or without um, a, a partner in your life, how to be happy with romantic love and how to maybe be happy without romantic love. And both Mike and Benson, the main characters, and the two, they both narrate um, different segments of the book, but, um, they're both kind of beat up by their, um, by their past and uh, the relationships with their um, fathers uh, in particular that wasn't a good relationship. Do you want to kind of tell us about um, the family dynamic here for both of them? Yeah, absolutely. I think that I completely agree with you as far as one of my overarching concerns when like I started the novel, I knew that Benson and Mike and Mitsuko would have pivotal roles in the text and I knew that I wanted to give equal credence and equal page time or as close to equal page time as possible to Benson and Mike as they both explain their situations and how they came to be from their various vantage points. But I also knew that it would be a narrative if I could pull off a thing that I wanted to do that was largely about how to be okay, which is like a really anomalous idea. Um, okay with a partner, okay with yourself, um, and the many different forms that that okay could take, like trying to find a way to illustrate it on the page without being prescriptive or being uh, didactic about it. And their respective families or the families of Benson and Mike were really important to their respective arcs because in their own ways each character 
has to find a way to view the people in their lives and the people that they hold dear beyond the context in which they may have originally found them or the sort of like archetypal roles in which they may have originally found them. Um, for Mike, he has to view Mitsuko as his mother, but also like as a whole like composite person, which is like as a journey in and of itself to, you know, view someone that you've grown up with and that you have certain associations for and certain um, contexts uh, behind your experiences as, you know, a singular entity and a person that is full of multitudes. And Benson has to do the same with his own mother, father, and sister. Um, and both of the young men have to find a way to do that for one another or not and the folks that um, are around them. So in a lot of ways, a recurring motif is this question of who somebody is when they're removed from the context in which they were brought or in which they came up or who um, you become when you don't have someone who's constantly telling you how to be or what to be. Yeah, so Mike's Japanese American and um, his parents came to the States and had a really rough time making a go of it. They um, they were very poor for most of Mike's childhood. And then unfortunately his father became an alcoholic and eventually moves back to Japan. And so Mike is ultimately raised by Mitsuko, his, his mother, as a single mother. Um, Ben's a, um, a black guy and he had a little bit of a more privileged life because his father was a, a professional, a meteorologist. But um, his father also falls into alcohol addiction and the family breaks up. Um, and so I guess I, the question is, um, how did you kind of decide to make both of, the, both of the guys' fathers kind of fall into this, this alcohol addiction? And, and what were you wanting to show us in terms of like the, the different ways that the family relates to that? Yeah, I think that from the very start, from just like a structural standpoint that probably nobody really cares about it, they were foils for one another, or I suppose two different sides of the same coin. And I think that from the outset, my original plan was to show the different ways that a family could form around these men and the troubles that they may have undergone and how and if they could change and how and if they could change one another. But as I wrote more drafts, they became people. Um, and uh, my concerns change from being, you know, prescriptive to trying to find a way to paint the interactions of Benson and Mike's fathers and the relationships that both men had with the people that they came up with and to do that in a way that had a multitude of layers. Um, I didn't want it to be a scenario where a reader walked away from the page having read like a passage about Asia or having read a passage about Benson's father and thought, wow, like that, he's just like the worst person, you know, <laughs> or like, oh, you know, like this is he's so bad. This is the reason that, you know, they are the way that they are. Yeah, nothing's ever going to get better. Um, it's a lot more nuanced. It, yeah, it, it's complicated, right? It, it's tricky. And I, I think that there, it, it would have been easy in a lot of ways to just sort of relegate the fathers or any of the characters as being like the bad guy, so to speak, or being, you know, being the, the antagonist. But I didn't want there to be a clear or even a peripheral antagonist in the narrative. I just wanted there to just be a bunch of people that were trying to figure out their respective situations to the best extent uh, that they knew how. So how, so keeping that in the back of my head will so shine. Uh, uh, sort of weave their various trajectories together was definitely on the forefront. I, um, I want to emphasize, um, because it's important to people right now, um, there's a lot of humor to this book. Um, and that's the number one thing when people walk through the bookstore door right now, they're like, oh, everything is so grim. I need something, I need something a little bit funny, a little bit humorous. And the book starts out, the first 70 pages or so are narrated by Benson. And you've kind of set up a very ludicrous situation here for Ben because um, 
He's living with his lover, Mike, and they've been having a little bit of a rocky time lately. Um, but Mike just kind of tells Ben, um, my mom's on her way from Japan to stay with us. Oh, and by the way, I'm leaving the same day to go to Japan because my dad is dying. And so Ben's left with Masuko and kind of, um, they're alone, they've never met, they don't know each other, totally different cultures. Um, and it, it's, it's, really, it's really funny. And I, I absolutely love the character of Mitsuko. She's just, she's just so awesome. And I know that you traveled um, to Japan when you were working on this novel. So tell me about the Japan connection and, and why you picked that country and, and uh, Japanese characters. Yeah, so I have friends out there. So for the past while, like five and a half, six years, I'm usually there, you know, once a year, barring a global pandemic. And I'm not there, you know, I certainly wasn't there like the first few times I was going in like an academic context or like for the sake of like professionalizing like my trip or the experiences that I had there so much as just, you know, to hang out and just, you know, be around friends. But every time that I've gone to Osaka, like people have been so generous with their time and people have been deeply kind, whether friends or strangers and nobody owes you that. And I certainly don't think that you can expect that. So that always really stuck with me. So when I was starting Memorial, and once I sort of solidified on the fact that a good chunk of it would take place in Osaka and would concern um, Mike's experiences over there, the goal on my end was to try and take that composite warmth that I had been privy to and try to put that on the page, which was kind of a tricky thing to do because that's like a really anomalous like emotion, like what does warmth look like on the page? But um, it certainly informed the tone of the text and it really led back to this larger idea of like when I was, you know, originally starting the book and like throughout the process of the book, and I think I've said this like a few times now, but like I, I didn't think that it would it would hold as true as it seems to as of late. Like I wanted to write something that didn't make you know people feel worse for having read it, or I didn't want um, someone to you know put the book down at the end of it and just feel bad, which didn't feel the same as not having you know challenging things or dramatic things or troubling things happen to the characters, but trying to find a way to deliver the narrative so that those traumatic things or those challenging things weren't like the crux of you know the, the characters existences on the page of points of their being there so it's really trying to um, balance between the conflicts that characters might be occurring on the page as well as just like the rest of their lives was something that was like structurally and just like as far as like the emotional texture of the book was really on the forefront of my mind but also like just really trying to conjure the warmth that I've experienced in Osaka and the warmth that I've experienced in Houston and put that on the page um, was pretty important to me for both locales. Food is a big character of sorts in, in the book. And uh, Mike works at a restaurant. Mitsuko comes and stays with Ben and pretty much immediately starts cooking and trying to teach Ben to cook. So um, did you, do you cook? And like, what's, what's the food connection? Are you, I guess maybe you're a foodie. Yeah, yeah, so I do cook, like I don't, I really like food, like I'm always, tentative about the word foodie because like more often than not like you, you know you talk to people and they'll be like oh I'm not a foodie and yet they'll have like really hard line taste and they'll have like a really strong sense of like what they like and what they don't like and like yeah you are like you know you're, you're someone who like appreciates food <laughs> oh so maybe in that regard I am but I think that for me as far as like the page is concerned uh, cooking was really another language for which to have each of the characters interact in their various ways in the same way that, you know, Benson might text one another or they send photos to one another or they sort of grasp that like the spaces uh, between the, the, the silences that they have. Um, and there's, 
again, not really something that I'd expect like anyone else to care about with me. But what was really important to me was to have arcs as far as the cooking was concerned for each character. And it was actually a fairly drawn out process. And, you know, I had like a chart like on my wall of like who cooked what and like when they cooked it and like why they were cooking it. Because for Benson, there's a reading of the book where he, his trajectory, so to speak, is ultimately becoming someone who wants to speak up for himself and like knows what he wants. And as the cooking comes into play and that he, you know, has to make the journey from someone for whom like scrambled eggs is just like witchcraft to someone who can be comfortable in the kitchen and can, you know, figure out what the folks around him want or what they might need in a moment, even if they aren't vocalize it. And on the other side of that, there's a reading where Mike's trajectory is someone who becomes illicit ultimately. And while he had like a grounding in the kitchen to begin with, which really opened up like what he could cook and when he could cook it, um, really trying to figure out how the meals that he put in front of folks segue from the sort of him imposing his will or what he thought on them to really having um, more emotional awareness um, as far as like what they may want or need. But Mitsuko like in a lot of ways was the um, overarching presence uh, as far as like the cooking and was concerned because while she and Ben may have their troubles to begin with, in the initial outset of the narrative and while her and Mike certainly have their own trajectory as they you know come together and apart and together and apart. Um, she's the one character in the book who is constantly trying to comfort folks through cooking and is constantly emotionally aware and is constantly working to make folks feel better whether about their circumstances or just about themselves or even just in the moment. So really trying to be intentional about the cooking and who's cooking what and you know why they were doing that was really important to me. But I don't think any of that is divorced from the fact that just like writing about food is fun and you know writing in a lot of ways is just like a, a <laughs> grueling process. Uh, like a privilege to do it just like it's like a hassle in a lot of ways. So like once you find like there once, you know, at least in my case, once I find something that's like fun to do, I try and tend to stick with it. So did you, um, did you do any Japanese cooking lessons or do you just eat a lot of Japanese food? I mean, it, the, the detail is very, very real. So I have to think that you studied it a little bit or you do it often. Yeah, well, I cook a, I cook a pretty decent amount of like Japanese adjacent food or Japanese adjacent cuisine like in yeah. my own life and because I'm really fortunate because I have you know friends that are Japanese or Japanese American and a lot of it is just me just like watching them and just like hanging out and then like taking the time to like show me um, different things but if there's a dish in the book then I cooked it a few times even if only from like a structural standpoint to get a sense of like can someone like talk or have like a conversation and multitask whilst they're cooking this thing and like what level of proficiency would they need in the kitchen in order to be able to like do multiple things simultaneously. So just trying to have like as clear of a sense of like what is actually possible for someone to do in the kitchen necessitated by having to like cook things like a handful of times usually to see um, what that could look like or not. Yeah, well, it, it, it feels real on the page. I'm so. glad. So good job. Um, and what you said about the um, the trajectory of the characters, it's really true. Um, I'm thinking right now about um, a meal that Ben and Mike and Masuko have um, the night before she leaves to go back to Japan. And um, Ben and Mike, are the relationship is still a little bit uncertain and it's not clear whether Mike is gonna go back to Japan um, as well. And, um, and Mike's mother asked Ben, you know, well, uh, I'm probably not exact on this, but you know, what do you, th what do you think he should do? And Ben says, you know, well, I don't know that it's really in my place to say. And Masuko says, well, yeah, and that's the problem because you know, you're not, you're not speaking up for yourself basically, so. Yeah, like trying to structure the narrative in a way that that final scene made a certain sort of sense was really important to me because it's like the one moment in the book where Mitsuko is like not cooking for other folks where she is finally receiving that comfort and finally you know receiving that service and that's when she's able to like tell that story and in the form of them a bit more 
In the form of four big margaritas. <laughs> yes, in the form of four. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, pleasure and comfort can take many different forms. Was, but, you know, it's it, it was important to me that she, you know, had her chance. That was very Houston with the margaritas. But also, um, I, also there's a very um, poignant kind of conversation that she and Mike have during, during that meal um, where it's still, it, it's, clear that Mike kind of blames her for what happened to his father's and you know his father's alcoholism and for the family not being together and for him growing up with for in large part without a, a father and I found it to be really affecting that um, his mother says well that's you know let's assume that you're right that I that I'm responsible for breaking up the family you know Think about how difficult that was for me to think that you could you would live a better life alone with me than the life that we would have with your father and that was uh that was a very i think um emotional scene in the book yeah that was the you know the book took like two and a half years i think to write like as far as like just me myself just like doing it before showing um, any iterations to my agent, but that particular um, whole scene and maybe one other one by themselves took a few months to land the way that I wanted them to, both emotionally and just like as far as rhythm is concerned, because uh, what really was important to me was to make space in that conversation for many different things to be true simultaneously. Like I didn't want it to be a case where Mitsuko's experience and her narrative, as far as like her life were concerned, could be reduced or be um, contrasted by Mike. And I also didn't think that I wanted the same to be true for Mike, right? Like I didn't want to reduce his experience or like for his to be like heavily like contrasted because they were both valid, um, even though they were different advantage points. So really working to build a larger image as far as like those memories were concerned, as opposed to supplanting one iteration of events for another or superseding one or the other saying one is more valid and more important than the other was really important to me. And that took a little while to try and get down the way that it ultimately surfaced. The book um, really, I think, um, highlights kind of the cultural melting pot that Houston is. Um, you've got folks from all different walks of life and cultures. Ben um, makes a good friend with a guy named Omar, whose son is in the daycare center that he works for. And you've got just the conglomerate of of um, skin tones and peoples and nationalities and and cuisine that make up that make up Houston and and also the very different neighborhoods that I think is really cool because as I think about it I, I don't really know that I know a lot of books that take place in Houston and I'm thinking that there's a lot of people out there in the country that really maybe haven't spent a lot of time in Houston or don't know much about it. So I thought it, it was a really, um, a really good view of kind of what the city is like and the different areas. Tell me about the, the, um, the title, Memorial. Yeah. How, how did you decide on a title? So interestingly enough, the, title was something that didn't change from the very outset of the story from when it was like a collection of notes to when it was like a short story to when it was like a longer series of drafts until like the very final like iteration uh, like the finished copy like the title never changed um partly because there is a pivotal scene that takes place in memorial uh, that part of town and you know maybe it's like a surface level um logical uh, making sense but also like this idea of a memorial memorial um as like a moment in time was really important to me because just the way that the book is structured it's really not as far as uh, story time is concerned like the linear time that passes it's a handful of months you know and yet it's very 
I, I don't know, it's in a lot of ways that short period, like a season and a half, it's a crucible for uh, so many of those characters. And it's one in which they traverse a lot of emotional landscapes, uh, both uh, personal and interpersonal. And there you know, are questions that arise for them, um, some of which they're able to answer, some of which they're not able to answer. And it all takes place like, within you know, this very short, relatively short um, period of time. So what was always interesting for me, like even from like the initial notes of the draft or the different forms of like a memorial could take, like because the memorial can be championing something that could happen. It could be mourning something that could happen. It could be something like to look back and like to laugh on, like like to have a tiny memorial or something. And it also could be something to cry about. And that was also the emotional pocket that I wanted the novel to take as the whole and that I didn't want it to really cut straight down the middle of any one emotional trajectory or not. Um, like a goal for me was to have it be many different things and have it be those things uh, simultaneously, ideally without overshadowing or reducing one or the other. So as far as like a word that was able to mean a handful of different things um, to different folks um, over the course of the book memorial felt like it made a pretty solid sort of sense for me. So you mentioned that um, uh, that uh, cell phone photographs play a big role in the book and that's a lot of how Mike communicates with Benson from Japan. Um, and there are there are photos in the book itself too. So did you did you take all of those photos? Yes, I took all the photos, yes. Yeah, it was, uh, I, I was just really fortunate in that like I kind of pitched the idea um, to my editor and she was super game about it. And then we got to talk to the folks um, and on the design end and on the production. And then they were, you know, they, they weren't like dunking on me and saying it wasn't possible or it was a bad idea. Um, like everyone was deeply receptive and like very, very open to it. And, and they, you know, they saw where I was coming from as far as using it as just like another form of language. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't, it didn't really make sense to me at, at any point not to include texting or not to include um, just the different ways in which, um, you know, they would communicate with one another because that is, you know, just how people communicate with one another. So I was just really fortunate that, you know, everybody on the team was like really open and, uh, for it. So did you have a bunch of photos that you were considering and then you um, took some out or does it, was it pretty much obvious to you like where the photos needed to be placed in the in the text and what came first the text or the photos so the the text came first um and the photos came after but while i was writing the text in the back of my head i was constantly thinking like oh that would be like an interesting place to have a photo here oh this would be like a nice place for a photo and then i finally worked up the nerve to ask about it like once we were like a few um drafts down the line but i took quite a few um i think there was there's like a folder within a folder somewhere on my microsoft tablet where it's like 300 photos and just that, that which is not too much because like i'm very much like the annoying person who will like stop and like take a photo of something <laughs> and people will be like what, are, like, what is significant about like, there's nothing like, that you see the skyline every day. Um, so it really like, uh, it was, it, it ultimately went from 300 to about 100 to about 50 to, you know, cl closer to the amount um, that's in the book. And a lot of it was just me just like plugging and playing and like then printing um, the, the pages out seeing like how they fit together with one another or how they didn't fit and what I could do to maybe move things uh, around. But that was one of the, definitely one of the, the lighter moments as far as like the drafting process was concerned because it was really, I don't know, once I sort of got like the green light to do it, it became like a really um, generous thing from, you know, my team, but also like this idea of like a book is like an object, you know, and it's like a, t a series of texts, um, a series of like emotions, but also like having like photos to like calcify those emotions and like sort of um, cockroachize like when they occurred um, was just seemed like a cool thing in a way that you know at least for me like it's it's something like in life that is uh, like a recurring thing right like, you go somewhere like you have to take a photo to sort of memorialize it or you meet someone or you meet some friends and you take a photo to memorialize it so really getting 
uh, the chance uh, to, to put that in the book was, was pretty cool. Do you have a lot of people that ask you about how the book ends? Because yes. um, it's, I love the fact that you didn't tie everything up in a nice, neat little package, but I do know that there are, um, <laughs> there are some readers out there that they kind of, um, it drives them a little bit crazy to like not know, well, how did it all end? You know, um, do they live happily ever after or not? But um, I thought that, I don't know, I thought that your ending kind of captured the tone of the book very well in this again this theme of we're all just trying to figure out how to be happy in this life and um and everyone pretty much realizes that if you've got a, a grand plan there's pretty much 100 percent guarantee that that's not the way your life is gonna end up you just kind of have to roll <sighs> up. yeah it was so, so quite a few people have asked um i will say that while some folks have had more energy in the question than others. Like no one has like cussed me down or anything for like an end the way that it ends. Like even the folks who are just like, you know, like the, the worst type of human being for doing this, but it still makes sense to me. Um, and that was really important to me um, for the exact reason that you said, you know, and, and, and as far as like wanting to write a, a narrative about some folks who trying to be okay and trying to figure out what being okay looks like and if that okayness is like a lasting thing um it made a structural and emotional sense to me that you know the journey of it was more important than where they may or may not have ended up and interestingly enough like i think that it, it sounds like <laughs> deeply absurd to say to think about now but like a lot of what got me to finish the book was not knowing how it ended and trying to, you know, figure that out. Like I knew that there was an emotional pocket that I wanted to end on. I knew like how I wanted the ending to make like me feel and how I wanted to make the reader feel, but what that looked like um, in aggregate, like on the page, like I wasn't uh, solidified on like generally or specifically until like right before um, it happened. And then, you know, there was still some, some drafting, but what I will say is that like once I did get there, like it didn't really change. Um, and, you know, my agent was game for it, my editor was game for it. And I was just really fortunate that like, you know, folks got it, right? And like, where folks were like open to it being a bit more open in the way that, you know, life is pretty open, like don't really know what's going to happen, but you know, the fact of each character's not only working towards being okay, but just realizing, you know, even a handful of the things that they need to get there felt like, you know, an ending in and of itself. Well, Brian, thank you for joining us today. It's really been nice to chat with you and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting a big stack of memorial into the bookstore and putting it into some folks' hands. So congratulations on the book and, and good luck. Thanks so much. And thank you for taking, you know, the time to, to talk about the book, especially when, you know, so many other things are happening and time is at such a premium. I mean, it's a good deal. Yeah, it was, it was a joy for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.